Welcome to A Cloud of Witnesses, a series on the history of the Christian faith. In this video, we're going to examine the Christian faith in England in the 17th century. We'll focus on the Church of England and note how it was impacted by both historical and political events of this century. We'll discuss the rise and the influence of the Puritans. This was a group who wanted to see greater changes within the Church of England. In addition, we'll examine some of the groups who broke away from the state church and formed what are known as separatist congregations. And we'll focus a little on one of these groups, the Baptists. We'll conclude with mention of three influential Christians during this time, Richard Baxter, John Milton and John Bunyan. Essentially, there were three main religious groups in England at this time. There were the Catholics, then there were the Anglicans, or those belonging to the Church of England, and then finally, the Independents. Within the Church of England, there were two main competing groups, those who wanted to keep or return to more Catholic practices, and they were known as High Churchmen, and those who felt Protestant reforms had not gone far enough and wanted to further purify the church. And as a result, they were called Puritans and they were generally Calvinistic. While some Puritans were happy with Episcopalian polity, others wanted a more Presbyterian or even congregational form of church governance. The third group called the independents or sometimes separatists or even dissenters or nonconformists wanted to break completely from the state-controlled Church of England. And they generally favoured having congregational authority. The Puritans were not a homogeneous group, so the term broadly describes a variety of beliefs. They were generally Calvinistic in theology, but not all were Presbyterian. Some were comfortable with Episcopal governance. Generally, they were deeply convinced of God's sovereignty, which called into question the absolutism of kings. Because they wanted to see the power of kings controlled, they supported parliament. They believed that all life was to be subject to God, so they had an emphasis on personal regeneration and sanctification. And they appealed to scripture to settle all questions regarding faith and morals. In relation to personal morality, the Puritans were very strict. Some of you would be familiar with the term puritanical. There was a stress on conversation, consciousness of sin, the sense of the presence of God and his forgiveness. They objected to games and sports on the Lord's Day and to dance and drama. Their dress was often plain and they insisted on no eating or sleeping to excess, and critics said they slipped into legalism. In terms of worship, the Puritans looked to the example of simplicity in the early church, and they wanted to abolish anything that had links to the mass. They objected to the continuing practices of kneeling at communion, using the sign of the cross at baptism, and the use of the surplice by the priests. They also objected to the ceremonial and gorgeous furnishings still being found in the churches. One of the significant Puritan leaders at this time was Thomas Cartwright. He was the professor of theology at Cambridge University. He supported a moderate reform of the church. He opposed church governance by bishops and his views laid the foundations for English Presbyterianism. Henry Jacob was another who was active in the early Puritan reform movement within the Church of England. In 1599, he wrote, A Defence of the Churches and Ministry of England. This was a reply to the arguments used by those who wished to separate from the church. It was Thomas Cartwright and Henry Jacob, along with others, who were instrumental in facilitating the so-called 
millenary petition. This petition contained a thousand signatures and was a wish list of Puritan reforms, which was submitted to the new English ruler, King James I, on his accession to the throne. This new Scottish king was thought to be sympathetic to religious forms similar to those of the Church of Scotland. While King James agreed to hear the arguments, in reality he was not sympathetic to Presbyterianism. In 1604, Henry Jacob wrote, Reasons taken out of God's word and the best human testimonies proving a necessity of reforming our churches in England. He addressed this work to King James I with the following assertion, and I quote, It is necessary to reform the churches of England, their ministry and ceremonies. He then went on to provide eight reasons to establish proof for his assumption. One of his main points was that each congregation should be self-governing. And he wrote, The true and proper visible churches of Christ, though many in number, yet all are but one in nature, form and constitution. And each of them hath simply one and the same spiritual or ecclesiastical power immediately from Christ, not derived from any other, to govern itself with all. Henry Jacob wanted each congregation to be free to choose its own pastor and to determine its own affairs. Thus, Jacob supported a more congregationalist style of church polity. Ultimately, Jacob was imprisoned for his views and then later fled to Holland, but returned to lead an independent congregation in London. Jacob did not reject the authority of the state church, but rather argued that other independent congregations of equal status could coexist outside the control of the state church. Tolerance was a major component of Jacob's theology, and this was at a time when toleration was generally lacking. Eventually, in 1622, due to internal problems within his congregation, Henry Jacob left England for the American colonies with some members of his church. He established a religious community at Jacobopolis in Virginia, but later returned again to England where he remained until his death. Jacob left a major legacy to the developing congregational movement, and after his death, a breakaway element from his churches would form the group known as the Particular Baptists. While Congregationalists were Calvinists, like Presbyterians, they differed to them in polity. Presbyterians stressed that individual churches should be primarily governed by elders, although members in some cases had some authority. In addition, Presbyterians argued that there be a wider body of authority, such as a synod. Congregationalists, on the other hand, focused on the authority of the individual local church. This meant that the members of each church had the right to decide their church's forms of worship and confessional statements, as well as choose their own offices and administer their own affairs without any outside interference. Congregationalists argued that their polity was rooted in the New Testament idea of the priesthood of all believers. James I became the King of England and Scotland in 1603. He'd been born in 1566, the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, and he was ruling as James VI of Scotland when Queen Elizabeth I died, and so he was called to the throne of England. Thus, under James, the nations of England and Scotland were united under the one king. The Basilicon Doron, meaning royal gift, was written by James, then just the King of Scotland, for his son Charles in the year 1599. This gives us an understanding regarding the thoughts and the beliefs of James, who, remember, had been brought up by Protestant tutors. Diligently read his word and earnestly pray for the right understanding thereof. Search the scriptures, saith Christ, for they will bear testimony of me. 
The whole scriptures, saith Paul, are profitable to teach, to improve, to correct, and to instruct in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect unto all good works. The whole scripture containeth but two things, a command and a prohibition. Obey in both. The worship of God is wholly grounded upon the scripture, quickened by faith. As mentioned, upon taking up the throne, James was presented with the millenary petition by the Puritans. Some of the specific concerns that the Puritans had were to do with rituals that were not seen as being biblical and therefore not necessary. And these rituals included the signing of the cross during baptism, confirmation, the administration of baptism by women, the use of the ring in marriage, bowing at the name of Jesus, the elaborate dress of the ministers, and priests living in the church. He organised the Hampton Court Conference, where he rejected their request. James was strongly opposed to anything other than the Episcopal form of church government. He said, that the Scottish Presbyterianism, quote, agrees with monarchy as well as God and the devil, and that no bishop meant no king. James did, however, agree to fulfil one request, authorising an official translation of the Bible. This came to be known as the King James Version, and sometimes the Authorised Version, and was completed in 1611. To further incense the Puritans, James then appointed Richard Bancroft as Archbishop of Canterbury. Bancroft was from a group known as High Churchmen. This group wanted to continue the system of bishops for their church government and opposed any further changes to the Church of England, made or advocated by the Puritans. Some of their number wanted to return to a more Catholic observance. Bancroft reintroduced ornaments and ceremonies which had been discarded. In addition, about 300 ministers were removed from their positions, while others were silenced or in some cases imprisoned for their Puritan views. William Bradford, who was a member of the Separatist congregation from Scrooby and later governor of the Pilgrim's Colony in Plymouth in New England, described these hard times during the rule of James I. But after these things, they could not long continue in any peaceable condition, but were hunted and persecuted on every side. So as their former afflictions were, but as flea-bitings in comparison, of these which now came upon them. For some were taken and clapped up in prison, others had their houses beset and watched night and day, and hardly escaped their hands. And yea, most were fain to fly and leave their houses and habitations and the means of their livelihood. In November 1605, what became known as the Gunpowder Plot was discovered. This was a foiled attempt to blow up the Parliament by Catholics led by Guy Fawkes. And it's this event that established the tradition of Bonfire Night. We're now going to watch a lineage video on Guy Fawkes. Remember, remember, the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason and plot. I see no reason why Guy Fawkes should ever be forgot. A short rhyme that I, along with numerous other children growing up in England, learned in school, and yet today it seems that many have forgotten the story. In the early 1600s, England was under a Protestant king, King James. Born in Edinburgh Castle, he ascended to the Scottish throne, and when the Scottish and English thrones merged in 1603, he became the King of England as well. 
King James is best known for the translation of the Bible that is named after him, translated over a period of five years and released in 1611. It is a masterpiece of the English language, shaping many of the terms and phrases that we use today. Had the gunpowder plot in 1605 been successful, it is likely that the work of translation would have stopped. The Crown of England had gone back and forth between Catholic and Protestant hands in the early to mid 16th century, but during the reign of Elizabeth I, some stability had been brought to the throne. Despite this, it was the dream of Catholics, both at home and abroad, to restore a Catholic monarch to the throne. An audacious plot was launched to assassinate the king, not by a bullet or by poison, but by blowing up the Houses of Parliament during the state's opening of Parliament, thus not only killing the King, but also many of his close advisers and members of Parliament. It was then the hope of the Catholics to bring a new monarch and government to England. In those days, security was not what it is today and they were able to rent a space underneath Parliament which they filled with 36 barrels of gunpowder. This huge supply of explosives could not be detonated remotely and someone had to light it manually and that job fell to Guy Fawkes. Fawkes, born in York, had worked for several years in the Spanish army as an explosives expert and whilst he was not a major player in this plot, Due to the role that he played, his name is etched in history and he is the one best remembered. Up to this point, everything had been kept top secret, but there was to be a fortunate leak. Just prior to the 5th of November, an anonymous letter was sent to William Parker, warning him not to attend Parliament on that day. Suspicion was aroused and a thorough search of the building took place whereby they found Guy Fawkes and his stash of gunpowder. He was taken to the Tower of London and tortured until he gave up the names of his fellow conspirators. The coherence of his signature before and after his torture reveals the severity of his punishment. Eventually they captured and executed all those involved in the plot, including the ringleader, Robert Catesby. The King and Parliament had been saved. England had been spared under the bloody takeover and Protestantism remained the dominant religion. Today, this event is commemorated in every village, town and city across the country with bonfires being lit. In an event often fondly known as Bonfire Night. In a country that has remained independent for hundreds of years, this is perhaps the closest thing to a national or Independence Day celebration. Something that stands out from this episode of history is how thin and fragile the line is between freedom and tyranny. A famous person once said that your freedom and mine cannot be separated. And yet today we live in a society where if someone's rights are being abused, people are more likely to film it on their mobile phones than they are to stop and do something to help. May we defend our freedoms, civil and religious, any time they come under attack, and the freedoms of others, if we ever see them, under threat as well. Like Elizabeth before him, James also began to actively oppose the Puritans. He said, I will make them conform themselves, or I will harry them out of the land, or else do worse. In response, many Puritans fled England, initially going to Holland and other parts of Europe. Many Puritan groups would eventually make their way to America, where they would leave a legacy of religious freedom. For those Puritans who stayed in England, faced with this opposition and lack of change within the church, Many no longer accepted that the Church of England was the true church. This group were called the Separatists or Independents, as they advocated a total separation of the church 
from the state. At the time, in response to James's threat that he would make them conform, they were called nonconformists or sometimes dissenters. Many of these separatists promoted the idea of congregationalism. In other words, the church authority rested in the authority of each individual congregation. And here's a list of some of the important contributors to the congregationalist movement. There was Richard Fritz, Robert Brown and Robert Harrison, Henry Barrow and John Greenwood, John Robinson, and a group that eventually left England, the Pilgrims. Essentially, the idea of these churches was that they form a church covenant and bound themselves in loyalty to Christ and one another and to exist apart from the state church. Each congregation was to be in control of its own affairs, i.e. each was independent or autonomous. The separatists wanted to choose their own ministers rather than be forced to accept the choice of the bishop. They made no distinction between clergy and laity and important decisions were made by the congregation as a whole. They did not want elaborate garments or rituals and they rejected the set liturgy of the Book of Common Prayer. The congregational movement had made some tentative steps under Elizabeth. Richard Fist had begun an independent congregation in London around 1550, but he had been arrested and he died in dreadful prison conditions in 1571. Then, around 1580, Robert Brown and Robert Harrison began an independent church at Norwich. Brown was arrested and imprisoned for unlicensed preaching. But in 1581, he fled to Holland. And in the following year of 1582, he wrote, Reformation without tarrying for any. In this work, he argued that the true church was a body of believers united to Christ and each other by voluntary covenant. This meant that officers should be chosen by members and that no congregation was to have authority over another. Around 1586, he returned to England where he rejoined the Church of England, but he had laid the groundwork for independent or separatist movements. Robert Brown in turn influenced Henry Barrow and John Greenwood, who set up an independent church in London around 1586. Both Barrow and Greenwood were hanged in 1593 because they refused to acknowledge the Queen Elizabeth's supremacy in church matters. As a result of this persecution, many more dissenters were driven abroad to Holland and Belgium. There were two significant independent congregationalist groups that met in Nottinghamshire in the early 17th century. John Robinson led a group at Scrooby and John Smythe at Gainsborough. One of those who became supportive of John Robinson was William Brewster of Scrooby. He let the group meet in his home and they did so for a number of years. But eventually, increased persecution against the separatists saw William Brewster lose his house, and the other separatists were also being watched constantly. They resolved to leave England as soon as possible, with the intention to head for the Netherlands, where they had heard there was religious freedom. In 1608, they arrived in Amsterdam, where they met up with John Smythe's Gainsborough congregation, who had also moved there just earlier. And not long after, the congregation moved to Leiden. Robinson had the idea of starting a new colony in the New World, principally North America. But it would be one of the members, William Bradford, who would later be an important leader of the group there. And these were known as the Pilgrims. <laughs> 
the modern Baptist movement traces one branch of its history back to John Smythe, who was an Anglican priest. He formed a separatist congregation in Gainsborough in England around 1606 and was later joined by a fellow minister, Thomas Helwys. It is thought that they met in secret here at the old Gainsborough Hall. In 1607, they took their separatist congregation from Gainsborough to Holland, to the city of Amsterdam. Smythe and Hellwise came to believe in believer's baptism, and in 1609, they were both, along with their community, baptised as adults. Now, there was at Amsterdam at this time an Anabaptist group, a group of Mennonites, and they had a community there. As to when Smythe became aware of Mennonite teaching is not totally clear. In 1610, Smythe and his congregation had begun renting a bakehouse in Amsterdam from a Mennonite merchant. It was in that same year that Smythe and some of the congregation applied to join the Mennonites. Helweis, however, did not support Smythe's decision and so there was a split. Smythe and his supporters joined the Mennonites, while Helweis and others in the congregation eventually returned to England. There were obvious risks involved with Helway's return to England in 1612. Once he and 12 other Baptists arrived, they founded the first Baptist congregation on English soil. This was in Spitalfields, East London. Prior to his return, Helway's had written a short declaration of the mystery of iniquity. In this work, he argued that the first beast of Revelation 13 was in fact the Catholic Church, while the second beast was the Church of England. He said that they were both promoting the abomination of desolation as mentioned in Daniel. In this work, he is also critical of Puritans who wanted to remain within the Church of England in order to purify it. A copy of his work was delivered to King James with a letter from Helway's arguing for the liberty of conscience. He said, The king is a mortal man and not God. Therefore, he hath no power over the mortal soul of his subjects to make laws and ordinances for them and to set spiritual lords over them. Possibly in response, Helways and other Baptists were thrown into Newgate Prison and it was there that Helways died in 1616. A few years later, another Baptist group began in London. This group broke away from Henry Jacob's congregation in 1633. And then in 1638, led by John Spilsbury, a specific Baptist congregation was formed. This was the first particular Baptist congregation. There doesn't appear to be a direct link to Helway's General Baptists, who were also in London around this time. So what was the difference between the General and the particular Baptists? The difference between the General Baptists and the particular Baptists was that the General Baptists held a more Arminian position, whereas the particular Baptists were more Calvinistic or Reformed in doctrine. Just six years after forming the first congregation, the particular Baptists produced their first confession of faith. That the particular Baptist confession was strongly reformed can be seen in a number of articles which adhere closely to the five points of Calvinism. For example, Article 5 implies our total depravity and speaks of our unconditional election. It says, all mankind, being thus fallen, and become altogether dead in sins and trespasses, and subject to the eternal wrath of the great God by transgression, yet the elect, which God has loved with an everlasting love, are redeemed, quickened, and saved, not by themselves, neither by their own works, lest any man should boast himself, but wholly and only by God, 
of his free grace and mercy through Jesus Christ. And Article 21 refers to limited atonement. And it says that Christ Jesus, by his death, did bring forth salvation and reconciliation only for the elect, which were those which God the Father gave him. There were seven congregations involved in the 1644 Confession. Forty-five years later, the particular Baptists met again in London to formulate a more detailed confession of faith. This time, there were at least 100 congregations that attended. And in 1689, a new confession was agreed to. The Baptists became particularly influential being involved in the leadership of Oliver Cromwell's army during the English Civil War, which took place in the mid-1600s. And also, they had an important role subsequently in the Parliament. However, the restoration of the monarchy in 1660 brought with it increased persecution of the Baptists. It's estimated that at that time there were around 300 general and particular Baptist congregations. Later, the general Baptists, like some Presbyterians, fell prey to Arian views which denied the divinity of Jesus. By the end of the 18th century, some Baptist congregations were calling themselves Unitarian. In other words, they were denying the Trinity. Back in England in 1658, at the Savoy Palace in London, Congregationalist followers of Henry Jacob and Separatist congregations met together to formulate a Calvinistic creed known as the Savoy Declaration of Faith and Order. Essentially, it was a modification of the Westminster Confession of Faith, which had been agreed to in 1646. The theologian John Owen took a leading part at the meeting at the Savoy Palace. The Savoy Declaration clearly spells out their belief in the authority of each congregation to appoint their own leaders. The way appointed by Christ for the calling of any person fitted and gifted by the Holy Ghost unto the office of pastor, teacher or elder in a church is that he be chosen thereunto by the common suffrage or common voting of the church itself and solemnly set apart by fasting and prayer with imposition of hands of the eldership of that church. In 1625, Charles I came to the throne in England. Charles was the son of James I and, like his father, believed in the idea of the divine right of kings. That is, that kings had been chosen by God to rule. Early in his reign, Parliament presented Charles with a petition of rights, which was accepted by him. This effectively reduced some of his power. Parliament was also critical of his religious policies. He believed he was the guardian of the church and eventually he dismissed Parliament. From 1629 to 1640 were known as the 11 years of tyranny. Charles I ruled without Parliament during these 11 years. The first years of this tyranny were marked by peace guaranteed by what was essentially a police state in England. During this time, William Lord was appointed as Archbishop of Canterbury. Lord, as a bishop, had already shown his opposition to the Puritans, having given a list for bishops to the king, with O for Orthodox and P for Puritan beside each name. Lord's policies revealed his strong opposition to the Puritans and many Protestants feared a slide back into Catholicism. Lord and Charles I returned to more Catholic practices, for example, calling the communion table an altar, and they reintroduced the practice of bowing. Lord also upheld the use of surplices, kneeling at prayer, candles, crucifixes, 
and other forms of worship that many English Puritans wanted to abolish, as they regarded them as being papist. Laud was harsh and cruel in his treatment of the Puritans. For example, he sent out death warrants and orders of mutilation. Persecution of Puritans included imprisonment, sometimes for life, the pillory, which was a wooden structure that held the head and the hands in place, fines, and in some cases ears were cut off or noses slit. During the repressive rule of Archbishop William Lord, the English poet John Milton advocated in his 1644 work, Areopagitica, the liberty to know, to utter, and to argue freely according to conscience. And this, he said, should be above all liberties. In 1637, Lord and Charles I tried to impose the English Book of Common Prayer on the Scots, who of course were Presbyterians. The Scottish Presbyterians then in response drew up a National Covenant in 1638, and as a result became known as the Covenanters. This conflict led to a rebellion by the Scots, known as the Bishops' Wars. Then in 1640, Charles recalled Parliament in order to raise more money to put down the Scottish Rebellion. However, Parliament refused to grant him this money until he had listened to their religious complaints. As a response, he then dismissed Parliament, nicknamed the Short Parliament, due to its brief duration. A few months later, Charles recalled Parliament once again. This time they met for a longer period and this became known as the Long Parliament. Meanwhile, Scottish forces had invaded across the border in the summer and had occupied large areas of northern England. However, the Parliament was united against the King and Lord and as a result, Lord was imprisoned in the Tower of London. Parliament then presented Charles with an important document which proposed that the Army and Navy be controlled by Parliament and they also requested religious freedom. This was called the Grand Remonstrance. Charles responded by trying to arrest those who were responsible. The leaders escaped, but more and more people supported Parliament. Ultimately, these actions of Charles led to the Civil War of 1642. In the August of that year, Charles declared war on Parliament and its supporters. These were nicknamed the Roundheads. Charles fled London and set up his headquarters in Oxford. There were initially some minor skirmishes between the two groups, followed by three main battles. Eventually, the Roundheads were led by Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell had become a Puritan a few years earlier and was a keen reader of scripture, and he believed that decisions ought to be based on the will of God, whether they be personal or political. Cromwell had no formal training in military tactics, but possessed an instinctive gift of leadership. His troops came to respect his bravery and concern for their well-being, an important development in their later trust of him. His soldiers, in particular the cavalry, became very zealous, convinced they were fighting a holy war. They charged into battle singing psalms. There were some radical elements in the Puritan army, such as the so-called Fifth Monarchy, which was a reference to Daniel 2.44, and another group, the Levellers. Some of them declared that the Lord was about to return and that it was necessary to transform the social order by establishing justice and equality. The English Puritans then joined forces with the Presbyterian Scots after signing a Solemn League and Covenant in 1643 for the purpose of jointly opposing Charles. In the Solemn League and Covenant, 
The Scots said that they shall endeavour to bring the churches of God in the three kingdoms to the nearest conjunction and uniformity in religion, confession of faith, form of church government, directory for worship and catechising, that we and our posterity after us may, as brethren, live in faith and love, and the Lord may delight to dwell in the midst of us. Note here that the three kingdoms mentioned refer to Scotland, England and Ireland, and the conflicts from 1639 through to 1653 became known as the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. Then the Westminster Assembly was commissioned by the English Parliament in order to establish a theological agreement between the English Puritans and Scottish Presbyterians. Among many of its decisions was the Westminster Confession, which was drawn up and completed in 1646. It was strongly Calvinistic in theology. As a result of this coming together, the Presbyterians from Scotland were asked to help in the conflict and early in 1644, about 20,000 Scots marched southward. The Covenanters then laid siege to Newcastle. The siege lasted from the January through to the October. They would ultimately take Newcastle, but in the meantime, some of the Covenanters travelled further south and joined the Parliamentary Army at Marston Moor. In July 1644, the Royalists faced off against the Parliamentary forces at Marston Moor, which was to the west of the city of York. The Parliamentarian cavalry under Oliver Cromwell routed the Royalist cavalry, and their infantry annihilated the remaining Royalist infantry. After the defeat, the Royalists effectively abandoned Northern England. Then in January 1645, Charles I's forces were defeated at the significant Battle of Naseby. From this time on, England was effectively under Puritan rule. Three years later, Charles and the Scottish nobles who remained loyal to him suffered another defeat at Preston. In 1646, the Westminster Confession was adopted by the English and the state church became Calvinistic. We can see this Calvinistic influence in this example from the Westminster Confession. It discusses and thoroughly rejects any free will in obtaining salvation. Man, by his fall into a state of sin, hath wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So, as a natural man, being altogether averse from that good and dead in sin, is not able, by his own strength, to convert himself or to prepare himself thereunto. The Westminster Confession was not so strong on the authority of individual congregations Chapter 31 said, It belongs to synods and councils ministerially to determine controversies of faith and cases of conscience, to set down rules and directions for the better ordering of the public worship of God and government of his church, to receive complaints in cases of maladministration and authoritatively to determine the same. Note here how it emphasises the Presbyterian polity of synods and councils and rejects the Congregationalist model of the autonomy of individual congregations. There was also the drawing up of a Westminster Catechism with its well-known first question and answer, the question being, 
What is the chief end of man? And the answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. With Charles now defeated, the Puritans took over. Initially, the Parliament was Presbyterian, but the army had become Congregationalist in sentiment. Through Cromwell's influence, the Presbyterians were removed and a limited Parliament called the Rump Parliament ruled. It was this Rump Parliament that had Lord and then Charles I executed, although to the disagreement of many other Puritans. In January 1649, King Charles, now under house arrest, was charged with treason. His words at his defence show his views regarding the divine right of kings, that is, that kings are above the law. He said, No earthly power can justly call me, who am your king, in question as a delinquent. This day's proceeding cannot be warranted by God's laws. For, on the contrary, the authority of obedience unto kings is clearly warranted and strictly commanded in both the Old and New Testament. Charles was sentenced to death and executed on the 30th of January 1649. In a series of campaigns fought between 1649 and 1651, Cromwell successfully conquered Ireland. His sometimes brutal suppression of the Royalists in Ireland still provokes a strong negative reaction amongst the Irish today. Meanwhile, a group of more radical covenanters called the Protesters had seized both political and church power and for the next two years held what has been termed the Rule of the Saints. Sadly, one aspect of this rule was its strict and often brutal treatment of sins. For example, adultery became a capital punishment. Meanwhile, shortly after the death of Charles I in January 1649, the Scots proclaimed Charles's son, Charles II, as the king. Charles, though, had fled to Europe and the Scots would only allow him to return and take up the throne if he made assurances that he would establish Presbyterianism in all three kingdoms. Charles reluctantly agreed, and he arrived back in Scotland in June 1650. In response, Cromwell invaded Scotland. The Scots were defeated at the Battle of Dunbar, but Cromwell was much less hostile to the Scottish Presbyterians some of whom had been his allies in the First Civil War, than he was to the Irish Catholics, whom he saw as God's people, though deceived. Oliver Cromwell eventually took the reins of power, and in 1653 he dismissed Parliament. He ruled as a virtual dictator with the aid of his army. During this period, he divided England into military districts ruled by army major generals, who answered only to him. Generally, he was tolerant in religious matters. For example, the Jews, expelled in 1290, were allowed to return. He strongly believed that all so-called true Christians, from which he excluded Roman Catholics, also had a right to worship as they pleased. In terms of personal morality, laws reflected strict Puritan concerns such as behaviour on the Lord's Day, i.e. Sunday. It impacted things like horse racing, swearing, the theatre and so on. And here's a list containing some of the offences and their fines from this time. 1645, received of Mr Hooker for brewing on a fast day, two shillings and sixpence. 1645 received of four men travelling on the fast day, one shilling. 1645 received of John Seagood, constable, which had of a Frenchman for swearing three oaths, three shillings. 1652 
received of Mr Huxley and Mr Morris who were riding out of town in sermon time on a fast day. 1654, received of William Glover and of Isaac Thomas a barber for trimming a beard on the Lord's Day. 1655, received of a Scotchman drinking at Robert Owen's on the Sabbath, two shillings. In 1657, Cromwell was offered the crown by a reconstituted parliament. This presented him with a dilemma, since he had been instrumental in abolishing the monarchy. After six weeks of deliberation, he decided to reject the offer. Instead, he was ceremonially reinstalled as Lord Protector. After Cromwell died in 1658, the English possibly in reaction to the strict rules of the Puritans, recalled Charles II and adopted Episcopacy again. In May 1660, the son of Charles I was crowned King Charles II. This period was known as the Restoration, referring to the restoration of the monarchy as well as Episcopacy of the Church of England. Many of those who had signed the death warrant of Charles I were executed, while others were given life imprisonment. Parliament would not compromise either with the Catholics or the nonconformists or the separatists and a strict code of laws called the Clarendon Code put the church and state positions in the hands of Anglicans, and so Puritans were once again alienated and even persecuted. In 1661, the Test and Corporation Acts were passed. This excluded all non-conformists or non-Anglicans from holding civil or military office. They were also prevented from being awarded degrees by Cambridge and Oxford universities. This Test Act was not repealed until 1828. This was followed by the Act of Uniformity in 1662. This Act was influenced by Gilbert Sheldon, who was the Bishop of London and then the Archbishop of Canterbury. The Act required the use of all the rites and ceremonies in the Book of Common Prayer in the Church of England services. It also required Episcopal ordination for all ministers. As a result, nearly 2,000 clergymen, mostly Puritan Calvinists, left the Church of England in what became known as the Great Ejection. During this time of persecution of nonconformists, John Bunyan, who was a preacher and an author from Bedford, was sent to prison for three months in 1660. Eventually he would spend 12 years of imprisonment in total. He completed the first part of his famous work Pilgrim's Progress in prison and it was published in 1678. In 1665 a devastating plague struck London. The death toll in London alone was about 100,000. About 2,000 died each week. Then in the following year of 1666, the Great Fire of London occurred. In four days, 13,000 houses, 87 churches and 44 public buildings were burnt. Around 200,000 were made homeless and most of the city was devastated. In 1672, Charles's Declaration of Indulgence suspended all the laws against both nonconformists and Roman Catholics. As a result, John Bunyan was released. But Parliament revoked the declaration the following year. Then on his deathbed, Charles reverted to Catholicism. Although he had infamously fathered numerous illegitimate children, he acknowledged about 14 of them, there were no legitimate children that survived him. Upon the death of Charles II, James II, who was the son of Charles I, 
and thus the brother of Charles II, became the king. He had also, like his brother, converted back to Roman Catholicism. In the first year of the reign of James II, there was a rebellion led by the Duke of Monmouth, who was a Protestant and an illegitimate son of Charles II. The rebellion was brutally crushed, and Monmouth and hundreds of his followers were executed. The severity of the sentences engendered support for the later accession of Protestants, Mary and her husband, William of Orange, as rulers of England. Following Monmouth's uprising, James II sought to establish a large standing army, and he put Roman Catholics in charge of several regiments. The king was then drawn into a conflict with Parliament, and so in 1686 he dismissed it. There was the fear that England would once again become Catholic. In April 1687, James made his own Declaration of Indulgence. This was also known as the Declaration for the Liberty of Conscience. It was a step in establishing freedom of religion in England. James suspended laws punishing Roman Catholics as well as Protestant dissenters. But it is unclear if he issued the declaration to gain the political support from the dissenters, or indeed if he was truly committed to the principle of the freedom of religion. However, the king also provoked opposition among leading Anglicans by a number of pro-Catholic actions. Firstly, he allowed Catholics to hold important positions in two of Oxford's largest colleges. Then he dismissed the Protestant Fellows of Magdalen College and appointed Roman Catholics in their place. James' public welcome of the papal nuncio, who was a papal ambassador, and the granting of public offices to four Catholic bishops added further fuel to the fires of dissent. In response, the Archbishop of Canterbury, William Sancroft, submitted a petition from himself and six other bishops requesting the reconsideration of the King's religious policies, particularly over the reintroduction of the Declaration of Indulgence, as they saw it as a challenge to the authority of the Church of England. Sancroft and the other bishops were arrested and sent to the Tower of London. There they were tried for seditious libel, but they were acquitted. Then in 1688, a son was born to James II. He would be raised a Catholic, and this was of great concern to Parliament. In order to stop this from happening, Parliament then invited William the Prince of Orange and his wife Mary, who was the daughter of James II, to take up the British throne. And as mentioned, they were both Protestants. They arrived with 15,000 English and Dutch soldiers, and in response, James II fled to France. Shortly after their arrival, they were required to sign a document called the Bill of Rights. This was one of the most important constitutional documents in English history. This gave Parliament the right to debate freely, to pass laws and to raise taxes without interference from the monarch. Politically, England passed from being an absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy. The Toleration Act of 1689 alleviated the position of the nonconformists, but inequalities still existed. The Toleration Act granted Protestant nonconformists the right to build their own places of worship. Prior to this, these dissenters would meet in secret, sometimes travelling miles to do so and often gathering together under the cover of darkness in fear of persecution should their activities be discovered. This is the old meeting house in Norwich and it was one of the first congregational churches in England. It was built in 1693 
just four years after the Act of Toleration. Meanwhile, Ireland still supported James II, and the French aided these Irish supporters. James made one serious attempt to recover his throne when he landed in Ireland in 1689. However, he was defeated at the Battle of the Boyne in the summer of 1690. James returned to France, where he remained for the rest of his life, under the protection of Louis XIV. The victory at the Battle of the Boyne is still commemorated annually by the Protestants in Northern Ireland on the 12th of July. In 1694, Queen Mary II died, and husband William continued to rule until his death. However, because there were no children born to them, Parliament appointed Mary's sister, Anne, as Queen. Anne would be the last of the Stuarts, and while she had 17 children, sadly they all predeceased her. After she died, George I became king. He was the first of the Hanoverian kings. Here's the lineage of the House of Stuart from Mary Queen of Scots. Her son was James I and her grandson Charles I. Charles had two heirs who took the throne. It was Charles II who died without leaving an heir and then James II. It was James II's daughter, Mary, who succeeded him after the so-called Glorious Revolution. After she and her husband died, Mary's sister became queen. That was Anne. Anne did not leave a surviving heir, so the House of Stuart ended, and the House of Hanover began. We're now going to look at a couple of influential Christians that lived in England in the 17th century. Richard Baxter was an English Puritan church leader and theologian. He became well known through his writings, such as the Reformed Pastor and Call to the Unconverted to Turn and Live. He became the pastor at Kidderminster Anglican Church when he was only 26, and he held the position for about 19 years. He was a moderate Puritan, and an example of this can be seen while there he formed a type of ministers fraternal, an association formed despite their differences as Presbyterians, Episcopalians or Independents. It was during his time at Kidderminster that he wrote The Reformed Pastor, and in it he outlined the responsibility a pastor has. It's in the context of encouraging fellow pastors why they should give of their ministry efforts to encourage weak Christians. He says this about the connection between godly living and effective evangelism. The strength of Christians is the honour of the church. When they are inflamed with the love of God and live by a lively working faith and set light by the prophets and honours of the world and love one another with a pure heart fervently, and can bear and heartily forgive a wrong, and suffer joyfully for the cause of Christ, and study to do good, and walk inoffensively and harmlessly in the world, are ready to be servants to all men for their good, becoming all things to all men in order to win them for Christ, and yet abstaining from the appearance of evil and seasoning all their actions with a sweet mixture of prudence, humility, zeal, and heavenly mindedness. Oh, what an honour are such to their profession. Men would sooner believe that the gospel is from heaven if they saw more such efforts of it upon the hearts and lives of those who profess it. He later rejected episcopacy and he became a moderate nonconformist. After the restoration of Charles II, he was imprisoned a couple of times, and on one of these occasions, he was imprisoned for 19 months 
when aged 70. His prayer here sums up his approach to life. My Lord, I have nothing to do in this world but to seek and serve thee. I have nothing to do with my heart and its affections but to breathe after thee. I have nothing to do with my tongue and pen but to speak to thee and for thee and to publish thy glory and thy will. Amen. John Milton, a blind poet, is most well known for his epic poem, Paradise Lost, which was first published in 1667. Paradise Lost is the story of Satan's rebellion and the fall of man and its consequences as this section of the poem reveals. No more of talk where God or angel guest with man as with his friend, familiar used to sit indulgent and with him partake rural repast, permitting him the while venial discourse unblamed. I now must change those notes to tragic, foul distrust and breach disloyal on the part of man, revolt and disobedience, on the part of heaven now alienated, distance and distaste, anger and just rebuke and judgment given, that brought into this world a world of woe, sin and her shadow death and misery death's harbinger in 1671 he wrote paradise regained this dealt with christ's temptation as recorded in luke's gospel and in contrast to adam and eve in paradise lost christ successfully resists satan's tempting and emerges victorious Apart from other works, John Milton, when only 15 years of age, wrote the words to the hymn, Let Us With A Gladsome Mind, which is a rendering of Psalm 130. John Bunyan is best remembered for his allegory of the Christian life, Pilgrim's Progress. John Bunyan was born near Bedford and he became a believer in his early 20s. And after being baptised, he joined the Baptist Church. Later, he became a nonconformist preacher for which he was imprisoned many, many times. His first wife died, leaving him with four children, one of whom was blind. However, he did remarry about a year later, but when he was jailed, his new wife was left to look after the children. He wrote of the hardship of being separated from his young family during his imprisonments. The parting with my wife and poor children has oft been to me as the pulling of my flesh from my bones. The hardships and miseries that my poor family was like to meet with, especially my poor blind child who lay nearest my heart than all I had besides would break my heart in pieces. I was as a man pulling down his house upon the head of his wife and children. Yet I thought I must do it. I must do it. His courage during these periods of imprisonment is exemplified in the words that he wrote. I must first pass a sentence of death upon everything that can be properly called a thing of this life, even to reckon myself, my wife, my children, my health, my enjoyment, and all as dead to me and myself to them. <laughs> 
As mentioned, Bunyan is best remembered for his allegory of the Christian life, Pilgrim's Progress, written in 1678. In this story, a man named Christian becomes aware that he's carrying a burden on his back. And this is how the story begins. As I walked through the wilderness of this world, I came upon a certain place where there was a den, and I laid down in that place to sleep. And as I slept, I dreamed a dream. I dreamed, and behold, I saw a man clothed with rags, standing with his face turned away from his own house, with a book in his hand, and a great burden upon his back. I looked, and saw him open the book, and read therein. And as he read, he wept and trembled, and not being able to contain himself any longer, he broke out with a lamentable cry, saying, What shall I do? After meeting Evangelist and being released from his burden, Christian then sets out on a journey from the City of Destruction to the Celestial City. On the way, he encounters many difficulties, such as the Slough of Despond, and is hindered by a man named Worldly Wiseman, and the Hill of Difficulty. He also faces challenges in the Doubting Castle. He's assisted on the way by a number of people, including Faithful and Hopeful. Pilgrim's Progress has been a favourite down through the years, and as well as the book, there have been a number of films made of the story. His last major imprisonment ended in 1672 with Charles II's Declaration of Indulgence, which gave freedom to Catholics and nonconformists. Although he spent a brief time in prison when Parliament revoked the Declaration. The words of the hymn, He Who Would Valiant Be, were slightly modified from the original words by John Bunyan in Pilgrim's Progress Part 2. The words of the hymn, are, uh, since, Lord, thou dost defend us with thy spirit, we know we at the end shall life inherit. Then fancies flee away, I'll fear not what men say, I'll labour night and day to be a pilgrim. As we've noted, 17th century England was a turbulent period. Many Protestants, in an attempt to escape the problems there, and in Europe as well, made their way to North America. In the next video, we're going to examine the Christian faith there. There'll be a particular focus on the Pilgrims and the Puritans who arrived in the area known as New England. And we'll discuss some key figures in North America at this time. Men such as John Winthrop, Roger Williams, and John Eliot. And we'll also evaluate the relationship the English settlers had with the Native Americans.